and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 67, License to Thrill. What makes for a great licensed board game? From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tonight, we're going to be talking about licensed games or games based on established media properties and what makes for a good one. To go along with that, we're going to be reviewing the new Minecraft Builders and Biomes game from Ravensburger. And we're going to be looking at another licensed Ravensburger game, Horrified, in our Bellhops Tabletop Weekend Review. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Up first, a comment left on one of my gamer gift guides, specifically the one that's featuring gifts for an expiring game designer. Andrew Ragland wrote, If I might make a suggestion, subscribe to the designer's Patreon and comment frequently. Post reviews of their work, share the links to their stuff and recommend it. The one thing every game designer, aspiring or established, needs above all else is an audience. Someone playing and talking about their games. Well, you can't go wrong by supporting an artist in any way to get their material in front of more eyeballs. Now up next, some comments on our various Cthulhu Death May Die YouTube videos. These have proved to be rather popular and have been getting a lot of comments. Uh, up first, Edmund Chow. Thanks for the playthrough. Side question. Care to share the card sizes for the base game? I intend to get my sleeves before my pledge arrives. Well, thanks for the comment, Edmund. According to Cool Mini or Not, the sizes you're going to need are 57 by 89 millimeters, 70 by 120 millimeters, 10 by 8.8 .8 centimeters, 14.8 by 8.8 .8 centimeters, and 7.4 by 8.8 .8 centimeters. Up next, from last week's review of Cthulhu Death May Die, we have PCUIMAC, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, who wrote, the dreaded boards are too small problem. Every dungeon crawler I know has this problem. Can we stop the PC culture crap in game reviews? We do many despicable things in games we wouldn't do in real life, including thermonuclear war. Well, that's right. There can be many despicable things in some games, but... If you're going to start a thermonuclear war, why not make it accessible for everyone who wants to start the war? Why should only old white guys get the fun? Now, Rodanov Claw writes, it's just another lazy Simon design and quick easy money for the grandfathers of board game design. Eric and Rob is also a party to the problem. Ever since Chaos in the Old World, Eric's design and development has been on a steady decline and I owned all of his games, so I'm quite certain on my opinion. I can't say I agree with this one at all, but thanks for the comment, Rodanoff. Not every game is for everyone. Fair enough. Personally, I think this one's a nice change from other games Cool Mini has put out recently. It's not just another Zombicide with a Cthulhu theme. There's actually some new stuff here, and they did something different. One final comment for today. This is one of many left by people that were upset that we were reviewing a copy of a game they kickstarted yet hadn't received their own copies yet. And yes, we had a lot of those. Dianicus the Spartan writes, hardly anyone that backed it on Kickstarter has got it yet. Business as usual there, I'm afraid. Now I replied to this to note that it seems to be a trend nowadays and that people who kickstarted the game are at least getting a lot more than I did and hoped it was worth the wait. They replied, Yes, I understand that. It's poor business practice regardless. And to be fair, that's the whole point of Kickstarter in the first place. This is the avenue you have chosen to get your game to the table. People have given you money up front, usually a minimum of a year beforehand. And for me, it's just bad practice. There is no excuse for it in my book. 
If it wasn't for the backers, there wouldn't be a game. It's as simple as that. And to see people sitting down and playing it when you haven't even received an email to inform you of which month you can expect to receive it is unacceptable. Well, I admit that it's hard for some to stomach for folks who backed it. Uh, I admit when we sat down to play it, we knew we were playing the retail copy, but we'd also heard from people who had received their Kickstarted copies. Now, I have to imagine those folks who got items, perhaps like the giant Cthulhu board, may have run into more manufacturing problems than those who just got the basic retail kit and plus a little couple extras like dice. Uh, unfortunately, what can you do if manufacturing problems exist? And we all know Kickstarter is rife with manufacturing delays. Uh, if the basics, most easy portion of it is good to go, they're still looking for money, even though it's been backed on Kickstarter. So they're going to get that out to the public. And, and un unfortunately, sometimes uh, on projects like this that have a lot of manufacturing aspects, that's just what's going to happen. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. And we start here Wednesday nights live at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell. Uh, tonight, we've been talking about uh, Kickstarter games, actually, a lot of uh, the different games that are available and whether or not you've got a lot of Kickstarters happening in your neck of the woods, whether or not that should either help you buy into a game or back off because there's just going to be too many copies around and just not worth playing. It's an interesting topic, actually. I wonder how many people adjust their buying practices based on the buying practices of the other gamers in their area. Like, I know at one time there was a local gamer we hung out with, Jamie, who was had his own group and I had my own group and we started gaming together and I started to notice, man, every game I buy, Jamie buys. And we have very similar tastes in games. And after a while, I started to be like, hey, are you buying this? Because if you're buying it, I'm not going to bother. And he'd do the same thing, which was kind of nice. And it let us save money in the long run because if I'm playing with the same people all the time, why do more than one of us need the same game? And yeah, we did have our own separate groups. So maybe there's one or two games that are good enough that you want for both groups. But it's something that's kind of fallen to the wayside locally. Like there are other local gamers who buy games, but mostly anymore, it's I bring out the game and then people go buy it because they played my copy and enjoy it. But I do wonder how much that affects other people's shopping habits. Well, it's also interesting. I wonder if there isn't a possibility that more games are actually getting purchased or at least a more a variety of games. Uh, again, if you're doing, you know, if you're not having to buy the games because you're splitting them with, you know, Jamie or whoever, then mm. you can buy more games because you're no longer buying half those games. Right. So yeah, more different games in, in the yeah. game group. Like I almost wonder if there's a, if it's worth setting up something like on the Windsor gaming resource, Facebook group of who owns what type of thing, right? Like, should I bother buying this or does someone already have it? Well, and that's where the game library, you know, in theory, you could get up to those, you know, Toronto game library yeah. levels of, uh, of shares. Yeah. But then there's all the problems with owning a game library and who owns it and what happens when yeah. two different people want to use it and who gets to keep it at their house and all the other mess that I personally don't really want to get into. No, no, absolutely. I mean, that that's definitely something where, again, and we've, we've talked about this in the past even, uh, where if you can get something like your local library involved, mm -hmm. uh, that really is the way to win because you, you take that personal problem out of it. You don't have to worry about hurt feelings and anger over this person or yeah. that person. All right, uh, not too much else going on in the lobby then. Uh, we'll be checking back into the lobby a few more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now the best way for questions is to to get to us is to go through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we've got a question about licensed games from Danielle, better known as Major Kayla here in the Bellhop lobby. There are lots of board games that come out linked to popular media, i.e. movies. What is the best and worst you've played? Now, we already talked about this specific question back on episode 60 of our podcast our start of fall answer all AMA. So if you want to hear that answer, feel free to jump back there where we do talk about the best and worst games we played. But I wanted to bring this one back up to look at from a different angle. 
is over the last few weeks, and especially at our Extra Life event, I found myself playing a lot of licensed games, more than usual, like a whole bunch in a short period of time, which is kind of strange to me. Uh, these are games based on intellectual properties that are outside the board game world. Now, this includes the latest Minecraft game, Jaws the board game, and Horrified, Universal Monsters. It's a cooperative game. All of these come from Ravensburger. Now, I've also been playing Cthulhu Death May Die quite a bit, which, well, technically under public domain, so it's not a licensed game, but I like to think of the Lovecraft mythos as falling kind of under the same umbrella as licensed games. Now, what makes these game plays stick out to me is that all of those games were good. Maybe not necessarily great, but they were good. And this is something that's becoming more and more common with licensed game, which is amazing. But for a long time, at least in the board game industry, this was not the case. It used to be that I was honestly like, terrified. I would not touch a game if it used an established brand or intellectual property. Like that just meant that it was going to be a bad game. And rightfully so. More often than not, historically, licensed games meant slapping a fresh coat of stickers on some old mass market standard like Barbie Twister, Grey's Anatomy Operation, or G.I. Joe Gin Rummy. Or if it was a unique game, it generally would have a roll and move or a spinner aspect, and maybe you draw some cards with pictures from whatever the license was in it. Or if, they, if it wasn't just a knockoff of another game, it was just a terrible excuse for a game, a bunch of mechanics thrown together, just there to keep people's like you're selling the the the, the name not the game yep. now the angle i want to take today is to actually talk about what makes for a good licensed game what makes these games i played recently great and then we're going to follow up with what i think are i think i've got 12 of the best licensed games on the market and none of them have a trouble bubble in the middle of the board no <laughs> Oh, there was someone on Etsy that was selling D20s and stuff and Trouble Bumbles. Since I lost G+, I don't know where I'd be able to find that person. But yeah, I, I would totally play a game if I had a Trouble Bubble and it wasn't just a D6 in there. But but I have to say, I, I think that Trouble is probably one of the most licensed games oh, ever. Oh yeah, it's I up mean, there. Everyone it's, it's has slapped their, their name on Trouble. I, I actually there. I, I'm lying because I said I'd play it with anything but a D6 in there, but there's an R2-D2. There's a Star Wars one that has the, the D6 with an R2-D2. Yeah, but of course, okay. there's no mechanic. It's just there's an R2-D2 in there, too, that bounces around with the die. All right, so what exactly is it that makes today's modern licensed games so much better than the drivel companies were serving up in the past? We're going to look at a few things that I think make the games better. So the first thing I think you need is the right license. For a license game to be successful, first off, people have to care about what that license is. Now, the most recent modern example I can see where this failed completely is the series of Atari games that came out. These came out over the last couple of years. Think Geek was really pushing them for a while. They're from IDW Games. And there was Centipede, Missile Command, and Asteroids. I, who, like, okay, Atari's cool. Retro gaming is cool, but who cares about Missile Command? Or Centipede, like Asteroids, maybe. Maybe Asteroids, I don't know. Not enough people care about these old games. Now, Buffalo Games was smart, and just this year put out a Pac-Man game. Now, Pac-Man's got some hype. That's a brand people care about. That's a name people know. Yeah, it's one of those really strange choices. Just because it's old, and even if it was a fun game at the time, I mean, Centipede and Asteroids got a ton of arcade time. I mean, those games made yeah. furious, uh, huge money but they didn't have story and, and buy-in other than the fact that the mechanics of that game were fun to play in the arcade, whereas Pac-Man had license and property, yes. and there was something to Pac-Man. I mean, Those he had TV shows TV and things. Shows. Uh, it was, you know, it was a huge brand. Uh, and so it really, you really do have to be careful what it is you're thinking about when you get a license. Just because it's a property doesn't mean it's got anything behind it to make right. sales. So having the right license can actually be enough to sell in a game on its own. This is basically what companies have gone off on for, for years, right? That's where all these bad games came out. I've got a friend who just dropped money, Wayne Humphrey, the Star Wars guy, I'm going to call him out, who bought the Star Wars Han Solo card game just because it was a Star Wars game he didn't own. He now regrets that decision. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, 
I, again, I, I did the exact same thing with Minecraft, to be honest. I mean, we yep. have the Minecraft board game. We've talked about it on previous episodes. It's horrible. Hard it has game. not made it back. A hard game. It has not made it back to the table since that first day. Yeah. I remember buying a Harry Potter, the golden snitch card game that had a mechanic that was if you had the golden snitch card in your hand at the end of the game, you won, which totally invalidated the whole point in playing the game because all that mattered was who had this one card in their hand at the end randomly. Well, like, to be to be fair, that's actually, yeah. <laughs> that okay, actually works tie-in. with Quidditch. Yes. I mean, thematic time. Uh, it, it's thematic. It's just, I mean, Quidditch is a pretty bad game in that way too. Yeah, so, you true. know. And to be honest, we're about to get to that point. So there you go. <laughs> it, it has our next step. But before that, um, the other thing a good license can do for a game, though, that is a good thing, is it can bring attention to a game that might have been missed. We spend a lot of time since having Daniel Zayas on the show. That was pretty much the, he was the one that, that, that opened our eyes to the number of games published every year. And this is now a year ago. There is an insane number of board games released each year. And it's impossible to play them all. It's actually impossible to keep track of them all anymore. Like even if you read every blog post, listen to every podcast, there's going to be games that slip under the radar. Having a known name on the cover of your game could get people to try your game that might have otherwise overlooked it. Like, put it this way. If you put out a new Star Wars game, everyone's going to be talking about it because there's a new Star Wars game. It's a way to draw people towards the game. And it's also a way to get people into tabletop, hobby tabletop gaming, right? To get people to play hobby board games versus your usual Monopoly games. Like a video game license could attract video game players to try their first hobby game. Or a movie-based game could get a family member to put Trivial Pursuit down for the night and actually play that new Walking Dead game because they love the series. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you look at even games uh, that I, I think don't necessarily need um, theming. Uh, we talk about a specific D&D game all the time that I think is a really great game uh, yeah. that I'm sure a lot of people would never have played if it wasn't covered in, in D&D stuff, uh, even though I don't think it, any of it needs it. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't have come to it without that D&D branding. Yeah, which actually does lead well to our next section because this doesn't happen in that game. Because the next thing I think a good licensed game needs is that the theme needs to come through in the actual play of the game. Now, this is where all those older licensed games fail. This is where the Monopoly games fail. Well, one of the ways they fail. People play licensed games so that they can feel like they're taking part of that thing, that thing they love. If you play a Star Wars game, you want to feel like you're a band of rebels fighting against an evil empire, or you want to feel like you're behind the helm of a starship or exploring the galaxy trying to find the rebel base. You're not playing Star Wars to roll doubles, move twice, and possibly buy a hotel on Tatooine. Yeah. (laughs) When you're playing a game about X, you better be doing things related to X. If it's a Minecraft game, you better be mining or crafting something or both. If it's a Battlestar Galactic game, I better be wondering who's the Cylon. If it's a Harry Potter game, there should be lots of spells and teamwork required. For a license game to be good, it needs to tie into that license and more than name alone. The more things that make you feel like you're part of whatever imaginary world is being sold on the box, the better. Macho72 says he wants to feel like a Jawa. I don't, don't know if there's too many games that'll give you that feeling. Well, there, you should, there should, someone should totally make a Star Wars Jawa scrap collector game where I, you yep. build bots. I, One of I, the most popular yeah. Star Wars play sets of all time was, I the don't Jawa, know where they, yeah, yeah. the crawler. was the Jawa build a bot set, which I yeah. had, it was worth a ton of money. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I mean, so often times they, they try. I mean, I, I there are times when I will give them the attempt, they failed miserably, but I will give them an attempt. And I'm gonna go back to trouble here because at some point, somebody at some Christmas gave us a copy of the Frozen Trouble. And I'm sorry, it's trouble. But they actually went to the trouble where if you hit that one spot where you cross over the board, there was an avalanche. You know, they they tried, right. they actually tried to, to squeeze it in there. It was desperate and it failed, but there was there was that, that one horrible try for thing and they had it broken up so the four characters in the game were four of the main characters in the in the movie and all that but you know again it's just it's trouble right yeah if you if you scrap if you scrape off all this the the, 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 the paint that, and, that, and that, stickers the theme comes through but there's no mechanic tie-in yeah. 
No, absolutely. You're just changing names, right? You're yep. pasting something on. And I have to agree that game Sean was alluding to earlier is Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep's not on my list tonight because there is nothing in that game that has a D&D theme except for the words in the pictures. You are trading cubes for other cubes and then getting a set of cubes to trade in for a card. Like, and the fact that it's like nowhere, it doesn't have, what are your D&D tropes? You need to fight monsters. You need to collect treasure. You should go in a dungeon and you should level up and gain experience and improve your character. You don't do any of those in Lords of the Waterdeep. Not a single one of those is in Lords of Waterdeep. Yep. No, Yet, it's, 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 it's got it's, the thing on there. And it's, uh, well, I mean, and part of it is it's the town management sort of thing. And that's, that's, there is, I mean, what well, it's rogue management, but, but there, yeah. there is, there is a growing part of d and I think, where there's a little more of that economic aspect yeah. for some in some parties but no i mean i even i'm stretching here to, yeah, to you're, try you're, you're, you're squeeze the one it in and i don't think it was there i don't think it was there in the first place yeah so up next one of the things that i think makes for a good game is the license doesn't matter now i realize this sounds like i'm contradicting my first part where i said you need the right license but what i mean here is the game should appeal to players despite its license the license should be the icing on the cake, the thing that makes the game even more appealing than it already is. It should be the thing that may draw in new people to hobby and get fans excited, but you shouldn't be something that needs, you shouldn't need to know the license. You shouldn't have to love the license to like the game. Yeah, like if you have something like Catan uh, Game of Thrones, you know, Catan is a great game. And if you can bring people to that game with a Game of Thrones tie-ins and it where it works, you get the Warriors on the Wall or whatever the whatever your actual tie-in is, that can really work. But you know, if you've got something that's just literally slapping stickers on top of your board of trouble. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much it. Because you shouldn't need a great license to sell your game because a good license game still has to be a good game. The actual gameplay and mechanics are the most important part of any board game. How fun is the game to play? How engaging is it? The level of player agency and interaction. All of the things that separate a good game from a bad game still apply when you throw a license on the game. Solid gameplay is what is going to get players wanting to play your game and play it more than once. What's going to get gamers talking about it and spreading the word? You can't have a good licensed game without it being a good game in the first place. A good game is gonna to appeal to all kinds of gamers. It's gonna get the podcasters and the reviewers talking. It's gonna get ranked up on Board Game Geek. It's gonna get gamers excited to play it, regardless of the fancy name or logo or character that appears on the box. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where there, there can be some trickery involved too. And, and unfortunately, sometimes I think this is gonna catch people out. Uh, and she games rightly references Labyrinth in the chat room, um, you know, it it had potential, it had miniatures that were gorgeous, oh, yeah. it had a really winning license. I mean, you, if you've got the Labyrinth license, you've got a whole lot of buying power in your fingers. And again, the miniatures are gorgeous, no question. Mm -hmm. But then they completely failed on the make it a game aspect. So completely failed. And so like, I think uh... until people got it on the table, they could generate a massive amount of buzz and drive mm -hmm. a lot of purchases prior to the first person getting it on the table and getting the review out there saying, oh mm. my God, this is horrible. Uh, and, and really, I mean, in a horribly nasty way, if they had paid a couple of reviewers who, because we all know there are reviewers out there who will take money and mm -hmm. we aren't one of them. And that's one of the reasons we aren't, we aren't rich and don't have multi-camera setups. Uh, but no, uh, there are reviewers out there who will take money for for reviews. And if they paid a couple of reviews, they could have driven the market up even more. Uh, I don't think they did at that. Uh, and I'm not, not accusing I, anyone of anything. If they did do that, I didn't see it. But, uh, you know, that's one of those things where if you can, you know, there there's ways to game the system. If you can make it good enough with a strong enough uh, property, you know, you can, you can get a whole lot of copies sold before everyone figures out that you've made utter trash. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, that same company got multiple licenses, including the Dark Crystal as well, which hurts because that's another game that just could have been so good to do so many things with that. All right. So those are the things I think are needed for a good licensed game. You need a good license. You need 
the theme needs to be tied. The mechanics need to be tied to that license. The two need to work together. I should be seeing that license in more than just the pictures and the stickers and the, the card text. And that license shouldn't necessarily matter. The, the game should still stand on its own without that license because it still has to be a good game. No, absolutely. So now that we've talked about what makes a good license game, what are some of the best licensed board games out there? All right, this is going to be our usual unranked list. These aren't in any particular order except for the order they came up in my brain when I was writing the show notes earlier today. Uh, these are some of the best licensed games I played. No, I have not played them all. I know there are other licensed games out there that have huge fans, and I would love to know at the end of this, especially from our chat room, what games I missed, which games haven't I played. For example, there are some big name games out there that are recently released. There's a big Marvel game that just came out everyone's talking about. I haven't gotten to try those. So the, again, these are just the games I've played, and these are the best out of my personal collection of games. Up uh, first, one Sean has even played, and that is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Now, we got this one for our kids who are huge Potterheads. Uh, besides being a very solid deck builder, this has some great thematic elements. You play through a campaign, unlocking more books as you finish each one. Direct tie-in right there to Harry Potter, a series of books, right? Players are all students. They have to cooperate and defeat the forces of darkness together. Players spend most of the game building their own decks filled with spells, items, and allies from the wizarding world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, we've talked about this many times. We don't need to go on. Uh, I think I've always said it's a very solid game. Uh, if anything, they, they up the difficulty on it a hair too much, especially when you move into the uh, the first expansion for it. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, you can manage that. Uh, you know, as a gamer, you can, you can, you can learn to balance your own, own games uh, if anything, the only real suffering point in this game is the lack of um, ability to whittle down your deck um, and, yeah. and eliminate cards from it, uh, which does, again, they did actually add that in in the, in the expansion, but doesn't exist at all in the first, uh, the main portion of the game. So and again, that was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. All right, up next, I'm kind of cheating here because I said I was probably only going to give 12 games, but I'm going to lump these together. It's the Fantasy Flight Star Wars games because if I didn't lump these together, this would be a list of like 20 games because Fantasy Flight has been knocking it out of the park with their Star Wars license. And for years now, like they just keep putting out more and more awesome Star Wars games. Now, three in particular stood out to me. Rebellion, which is a two or four player game that many people are calling Star Wars in a box. It's basically you are playing through the original trilogy. One team's playing the Empire, trying to find the Rebel base. The other are playing the Rebels, trying to not be found and take out the bad guys. You, Everything that's in the movies is in this game. X-Wing is one of the best dogfighting skirmish war games out there that is just so much cooler because you're flying X-Wings and you can fly Boba Fett Slave 1. And then we've mentioned so many times on the show Imperial Assault. One of the best one versus many dungeon delving board games out there that it also includes a great two player skirmish miniature game and happens to be Star Wars, which is a license I think everyone knows I dearly love. Yeah, no, it's hard to go wrong with Star Wars, uh, especially with the with Mo. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think you got the card game that uh, uh, you, you, you talked about earlier. But other than that, you've probably got uh, most of them out there. Yeah, I do have a lot of fantasy flight star wars games yeah so again yeah that was the fantasy flight star wars games as a general topic yes i don't know otherwise i could talk about more right there's the dice one that was pretty good but that one doesn't tie in the theme really to me at all the 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 duel so it doesn't belong on the list there's uh the card game i have one of the card games a living card game where it's double-sided there are just so many all right up next star trek ascendancy if Rebellion is Star Wars in a box, Ascendancy is Star Trek in a box. Explore a strange new world, seek out new life and new civilizations, and boldly go where no one has gone before. And unless you played the game enough times, you've seen all the systems that can come up. Uh, this is a great asymmetric game that plays very differently depending on which faction you play. Each faction's mechanics are tied thematically to the matching race in the Star Trek universe. The game lets you play the base game, lets you play Federation, Klingons, and Romulans with expansions, adding even more factions. 
this has all the exploration or all the battles or all the converting. There is all kinds of stuff going on here, all really well tied in. You're exploring the map. It changes every game. Lots of card-based randomization. Very cool Star Trek game. Yeah, no, again, Star Trek is another one of those properties where the fans are diehard. And if you make a good game that can really engage those Star Trek fans uh, and, and give them some meat. And again, the Star Trek fans do tend to be a uh, intelligent group mm -hmm. in general. So if you make them something garbage, they're going to notice. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is it is not going to you're not going to slip by with some haphazard Star Trek uh, stuff out there, because, uh, again, while Star Wars, you could argue, you know, a little bit of of uh, blaster battling is fun. Uh, Star Trek is is a very thinking man's show. Mm -hmm. I mean, they it's it's all about that sort of uh, negotiation uh, and and things. So you can't just build a whole game around shoot 'em up uh, and call yeah. it a Star Trek uh, and and really have fans take you seriously at all. And Star Trek is a license that is notorious for having bad games, and many of them, including many modern ones. It's, a, it's still rough trying to find a good Star Trek game nowadays. Yeah. Well, it, it's a tough, it's a tough balance. I mean, there's, there's, because it's hard, it's easy to do combat in a, in a game. You know, mm -hmm. there's a million ways to do combat in a game, but doing interplanetary negotiations and, and things like that are, is a little tougher to, to find a way through. Uh, but that was Star Trek Ascendancy. All right, up next, another fantasy flight game. I guess they're the ones that seem to get all the good licenses nowadays. Uh, game of Thrones, uh, specifically the second edition, though I'll admit I played the first. Second edition is what's available on the market now. Uh, this is a folk on a map game all about controlling Westeros. Up to six players each take on the role of a great house of the Seven Kingdoms vying for control of the Iron Throne. Now, this was released long before the popular TV series. So this game is all about the books and the, the characters from the books, which I assume are the same characters, but like the events are more tied to the books than the TV series. It includes all the warfare and diplomacy you would expect from a Game of Thrones games. Mechanically, the neat bit here is you're assigning orders to your units in secret, which will remind some people of a classic Avalon Hill game. So you never know when that ally is going to backstab you, which is pretty much inevitable in this game. People talk about diplomacy ruining friendships. I've actually seen it happen with Game of Thrones at one of our public play events. Well, you know what? This is one of those games where you don't have to worry about the showrunners slacking off and killing the last season uh, yeah. because this does nothing to do. This is George R.R. R. Martin content. Yeah. We don't have to worry about what some writer's room <laughs> did to our uh, fandom uh, and we can enjoy Game of Thrones as it was meant to be enjoyed. Again, that's the Game of Thrones second edition. All right, up next, I've got Battlestar Galactica. Now, this game is the perfect example of a great game that happens to have a theme that makes it shine even more. Because I first played Battlestar Galactica only knowing the series from the 1970s, which I did love. Uh, the owner of the game had to explain to me that Cylons could now be disguised as humans and kind of the overall plot of these humans not knowing who's who and all this stuff. I had no clue who these characters, why, and who, why I should care that Boomer could be a sympathizer or whatever. I still had a great time. It was actually the game in this case that got me to watch the series. And then returning to the game after watching the series, I'm like, ooh, the game's even better because now I get some of those interactions. But it was fantastic the first time playing it without even knowing the license. Now, one big warning on this game because we have seen it a couple times. Make sure the players know that the game doesn't necessarily follow or match the series. And the fact someone's a Cylon in the show doesn't mean they're necessarily a sign in the game. Because this is a long game. It is not a short one. You're looking at three to five hours gameplay. Finding out five hours in that someone's not playing correctly can be a horrible experience. Yeah, in some ways, it's almost a shame that uh, the game is as tightly linked with the show as it is because right. it's again with gamers uh, and, and, you know, people who are gamers tend towards role-playing and you, you, you have that feeling you want mm -hmm. to, to role-play. You, you want know, to if play you've the got character. this character. You want to do that. You know, if you know the show, if you're a fan of the property of the license, then you have that connection and you don't want to necessarily ruin it for you. Uh, and yet you can ruin the game for everyone. If yeah. you if you choose to go that way, uh, it's, but it's mostly people not quite understanding that it's not a play the character. It's yeah. not a role playing. game. It's not a role playing game at all. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and that was Battlestar Galactica. All right. Up next, I've got StarCraft, the board game. Now, you're not going to find this one on the market now, I got to admit. Uh, if you do, you're not going to want to pay what it costs nowadays. This is one of the first good Fantasy Flight licensed board games going way back. This is one of those original huge coffin boxes that you could bury someone in. And it's still one of the best asymmetrical games ever made. And it's also one of the earliest games to use deck building. It's an area control game, folk on a map, tons of miniatures featuring the three major factions from the video game. And it includes two versions of each, which actually uses some of the Brood Wars stuff. So you can play up to six players. The units in the game act and are used in similar ways to their digital counterparts. So you can un unleash a Zergling Rush to try to take down those difficult to breach proto shields. But make sure you hurry up, because if you give the humans too much time, they're going to update their decks too much with technology cards. Yeah, and, and this is not, I mean, uh, you, you can't get it, you can't really get it these days anyway, but it's not an easy game. Uh, no. It's not a short game, and it's, uh, but it is well liked. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not one of those games that's got, uh, you know, massive ratings, but no. uh, it's a solid, you know, it's a solid game. It's one of those, it's one of those games that, that sort of sl slots into that. There's a whole lot of people who like it, and there's probably a lot of people who have no interest in it because of its weight. Um, uh, plus a lot of people that just couldn't get it because that was going back to almost the Catan days, right? Like people didn't know to buy a Starcraft board game back then or who yeah. Fantasy Flight was, right? Yeah. It, it, it's part of an accessibility of that game issue. And unfortunately they lost the license. They did try to re-put this out as a Warhammer 40k game, but it is significantly different. And that's Forbidden Stars, which personally, I guess Warhammer 40k is, you can consider a license, but I kind of, to me, that's still in the same tabletop world. Right. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where StarCraft, you know, it it, it had its moment, but yeah. it doesn't have the same sort of staying power as the World of Warcraft um, uh, or Warcraft uh, licenses, I don't think. I think, you know, a lot of people probably aren't as familiar with StarCraft anymore because it, it faded away, whereas World of Warcraft just keeps coming back and won't yeah, go true. away. But StarCraft basically got replaced by League of Legends. Right. And that, that whole MOBA yeah, idea yeah. and that concept. Actually, to be honest, what could be on this list is the World of Warcraft board game, which is another huge box game uh, that tied in pretty well. But I only played it once, so and I don't own a copy, so I didn't want to talk too much about that. Personally, I, I remember preferring StarCraft at the time. And that was StarCraft, the board game. All right, going from something really old to something brand new. Uh, up next, I've got Minecraft Builders and Biomes. This is a new Ravensburger board game that does a rather good job of tying in just enough things from Minecraft into its mechanics to make you know that it's a Minecraft game while still being a rather solid set collection game on its own. Now, I particularly like the way they tied in the mining of bricks and the, of the various resources into the game. Something about that to me, it looks pixelated. That kind of cinched it for me. Now, I got to admit, it lacks the crafting element. It's a big part of the digital version, but no other Minecraft game has that yet either. So at this point, this is the best Minecraft game out there so far. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, it's solid a solid game. Uh, and, and I have to say, I really recommend it to uh, the majority of people. Uh, and again, that was Minecraft Builders and Biomes. All right, next, another Ravensburger game that's Horrified. This, in Horrified, you're moving around town trying to collect items to help you defeat the Universal Studios Universal Monsters. Uh, the game that's out now includes Dracula, the werewolf, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the mummy, the invisible man, Frankenstein's monster, and Frankenstein's bride. And the two of those actually work as a team. Each monster has its own set of rules, and the gameplay changes depending on which monster you face. The theme is pretty well integrated here. Like, for example of that, you're going to collect red items to try to destroy Dracula's coffin. Well, red items are weapons, so you need weapons to destroy Dracula's coffins. But once you do, you're going to need yellow items of sufficient power to defeat the Count. Now, yellow items are mystical items. And I like the way that, despite just being a bunch of tokens, they did some good work in tying those together. Yeah, no, it's absolutely... The, the theme in this game is really strong. Uh, they've got a fantastic license. I mean, you can't really go wrong with Universal Monsters unless you're making certain movies, but we won't talk about those. Uh, but as a okay. concept, as a property, 
Uh, it's a great license and they were smart. They didn't tie themselves to any of the films in any way. Mm -hmm. They did their own art. So they have, they have sort of removed themselves from any successes or failures of the film universes, uh, in order to stand alone with the property and the concepts of monsters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're even very smart. They outright say in several portions of the, of the, uh, rule book, we know the name of the creator was Frankenstein, but ah, yes, it's easy. The easiest way to refer to them is in a group of monsters Frankenstein is Frankenstein's monster. Bride. So yes. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's bride is how it uh, and Frankenstein's monster's bride is how it comes out. So they 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 even cover that standard argument. It's not uh -huh. Frankenstein. It's the you know they covered that. It's all in there. Um, really really strong strong theme. You it and again a powerful license. And that is Horrified by Ravensburger. Next up, another deck building game, Legendary Encounters Alien. Uh, this deck builder is based on the Marvel Legendary card game, but twists things up by making it a purely cooperative game. Hey, squad of Marines versus a bunch of aliens. We should work together. Now, to enhance this squad feel of the game, this includes a new mechanics and cards that let you help out other players by giving people bonuses when it's not your turn then toss in a hidden movement system to get that feel of not knowing what's around the corner, and then toss in, finally, a timing mechanic where if you don't act quick enough, the queen or the main baddie's gonna win to up the tension. I love that. I love the fact that, that all of those things to me say aliens, and it's great. And then you got a bonus that the core box actually includes different scenarios and strategies you can use that let you play through various movies in the Alien series all in one box, and you've got a winner me yeah no absolutely again aliens another strong content it's been going for years uh everyone is aware of the aliens uh properties from alien all the way to the newer prometheus's like them or hate them uh, um <laughs> and uh you know it's one of the things one of the things i love about deck builders and one of the one of the reasons why they're sort of my go-to is they are just so flexible i mean if you really take the time to craft them correctly uh, you really can evoke a whole lot of uh, emotion and tension and cooperation and things in that game. Uh, so uh, that was Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. All right, Charles Frank was in the chat. Thank you for joining us, Charles. We just got to the game you were asking about. That is Firefly from Gale Force 9. Here's a big map of the galaxy showing all kinds of interesting planets and ports of calls. Each has a themed deck filled with interesting contexts, contracts, jobs, some legal, some not. Out here on the edge of the space, there's a reaver ship. Watch out for that. In the galactic center is the Alliance. You don't have to worry about them unless you do something illegal. You wouldn't do that, would you? You're a captain. You got a ship. Time to find a crew and go. Like, I don't think anyone could have done a better job of capturing the feel of Firefly than Gale Force 9 did with this game. Like, it's it's there. Everything you wanted from Firefly is there. Uh, again, no, we, we need to start a list. One that I should probably get to the table when I'm down there. <laughs> um, huge Firefly fan, again, and it, diehard fans. Uh, they managed to, you know, scrape up a movie when, when it was dead. <laughs> uh, it, you know... And unfortunately, other than things like this, we will never have more Firefly. Uh, Joss, yeah. has, Joss has said outright that um, we're not getting more. So uh, uh, games there's, like... There's, they're still doing comics and expanding the universe yeah. through comics. But, uh, but you know, this is, this is a way where you can relive some of those feels from, uh, from, the, from the show, from the movie, uh, and, and, you know, keep it going. And that was uh, Firefly from Gale Force 9 Games. All right, this one I wasn't sure if I should put it on the list, but I put it on for one specific reason. This is Pillars of the Earth. And I did this because everything else we talked about are big blockbuster things with movies and TV series you can see on the screen and everyone's talking about them. Some games are based on books and books alone. Pillars of the Earth is an excellent medium-heavy Euro all about building a cathedral in medieval Europe based on the Pillars of the Earth series of books from Ken Follett. Characters and events from the book are represented by random events and crew cards. So while playing the game, you flip on an event and it'll be stuff that happened in the books. Now, it may not be tied to the license as much as the other games. I did want to include an example of a great game based on a little 
lesser known license. So this actually was a TV show as well. Oh, uh, my wife, okay. my wife was a huge fan of it. Uh, I never really got into it, uh, but yeah, no, this was uh, Ian McShane, Eddie Redmayne, Haley Atwell. It was a, it was actually a, a miniseries right. in 2010 uh, that did quite well. Um, uh, not well enough for me to have heard of it. Well, there you go. Uh, so yeah, uh, just if you if you're like Pillars of Earth and didn't know, there is a t uh, miniseries from. Uh, 2001 that's got an 8.1 on imdb actually it's, oh, that's it's not quite bad. well rated uh, and uh well apparently uh and she games is saying the board game is a series as well yes so yeah there there are multiple games there's also a column of fire and there's also a two-player pillars of the earth called something i can't remember the name off the top of my head i haven't played those i own pillars of the earth actually a really neat game that does some neat stuff with worker placement where you don't know what order your workers are going to come out you pull them over a bag and then if you want, you can pay to put your put yours back in to get pulled out later. It does some neat stuff that other games haven't done. It's, it's a very solid Euro with a theme that happens to tie in. This right. is one where I prefer the game without knowing the theme that well. <laughs> All righty. And All that right. was uh, Pillars of Earth. Up next is another classic, which I have no idea if you can still get, but it was my favorite collectible card game back in the day. And that is Middle Earth The Wizards. Now, this is long out of print. Um, you are playing one of the Ashtari, the wizards from Middle Earth. Yes, Gandalf and all those, but it includes all the the ones you may not know of unless you've read all the books or the Silmarillion. You're wandering around Middle Earth, forging alliances, recruiting allies into your fellowship, trying to boost your strength to be able to fight Sauron's army. Uh, this game was tied heavily to the books it was based on and included some really for a card game, complex quests to get the best cards in the game. Like you would have to go to Rivendell to get Narsil, the broken blades, and then you would have to go recruit a the right dwarf to fix it. Then you would have to go to the forge and play your dwarf and your Norso card to get Glamdring. And I'm probably getting all the names wrong here because it's been a long time since I played. But like there would be these multi-step things just to be able to play the one card that's worth a lot of points. It was nasty and neat, and it felt like you were on a quest and on an adventure. You were moving around Middle Earth and having to do all these things. And then another really neat aspect is only half your deck was doing that. The other half were hazard cards that you put in your deck to play against your opponent. Then, of course, there was sticking with the theme. There was another way to win the game. Instead of going around Middle Earth and doing all this work, all you had to do was play the one ring card at the same time your fellowship is at Mount Doom, and you won. But this was a collectible card game, and I still don't know anyone that owned of the One Ring card. I was never able to find one. Well, and that's one of those issues where you run into, and, you know, there's probably, there may only be one ring card. Who knows? I, I doubt that. But uh, that'd be funny if there was only one. Um, <laughs> but that was the, uh, the CCG Middle Earth, The Wizards. All right. Uh, there you've got thoughts on what makes a good license game, as well as some examples of games I think do it right. Remember, not only does the license matter, but the mechanics better actually be tied to that license. And even more importantly, the game better just be a good game in the first place. What I want to know is what you think makes for a good license game. Let us know in the comments, online, on social media, or in our chat room. Well, we're checking back into the lobby. Uh, we've got some some good chat going on in there. Uh, Poncho mentions, uh, it just hit me as a chess player. I hate seeing a license slapped on a chess set. Think Simpsons oh. chess. Now, this I find interesting because while I get the license aspect doesn't really work. I mean, historically, your chess pieces have always had a theme. Um, you know, there, there's always been some sort of, of physical graphical theme to it um so i mean i can get while yes yeah, throwing the silly ones on it like simpsons isn't um but uh what we consider the modern plain chess pieces are aren't actually all that um old i don't think uh actually i have to look into that but um uh, also uh poncho has mentioned uh mechs and minions since you mentioned uh league of legends uh, that's, a, that's a decent enough game. I like that one. Uh, the problem is I never played League of Legends to know if it tied in at all or how it tied in. 
So it, it may belong on this list. I don't know. It was a game that was good enough, but it wasn't good enough to make me go look for its source material. It's a solid game on its own, a cooperative programming game. What I liked in that is it did something different from Robo Rally. Robo Rally, your program wipes every turn. You make a new program where your mechs and minions program stays there and it just keeps repeating turn after turn. So the game's actually not about writing a program. It's about improving your program as things change on the board, which I thought was really cool. Some of literally the best components ever produced for a board game ever. Like they, they're they, like they make Cthulhu Death May Die look like a bunch of crap. Like it, it is a really impressive game. Uh, as I said, I just, I don't know how well it ties to the, like, I don't know if League of Legends is about little goblin dudes in mech suits killing uh, little guys in red suits. I have no idea. It's it's a fun, you know what, I, I League of Legends, I, I tried it, I couldn't get into it because I couldn't get a team, and, and it's really one of those games where going in on your own is just asking for um, flame and, and hard hardship. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it wasn't necessarily my type of game anyway. But uh, yeah, no, I played it, and uh, from what I can understand, it, it there definitely is a, a strong linkage between right. uh, the mechanic and, and the game, and uh, we've heard some good things about it. Uh, other than that, we've had a few, uh, a lot of little chat going on between three things. Uh, Major Kayla mentions that Betrayal at Baldur's Gate is actually better than Betrayal at House on the Hill. I've heard that, but I, I dislike Betrayal at House on the Hill quite a bit. It's not that it's a terrible game. It's a terribly designed game that can be easily broken multiple ways, like just the dice come up wrong or people lose track of things or they read the book wrong. So I never even wanted to try the Baldur's Gate one, even despite being a and d fan. I do wonder how much the D&D &D ties into that. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons is famous for having bad licensed games. Like, to be honest, uh, like D&D Clue has just been announced, a new version of D&D Clue, because there was one announced when 3.0 came out in 2000 um they're like the 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 D, D adventure games are solid i gotta say um tyrants of the underdark being one major exception that game is good and it ties in the theme good too because you've got a lot of drow stuff going on with uh, the promoting your people into your private house and sending out spies and assassinating people. I think that's a great example. But again, I didn't think, I, like I was thinking more established media properties when I wrote this, whereas to me, D&D &D is tabletop gaming. Plus my original thought when I started writing about this topic today was I was gonna include RPGs as well, but I think there's enough to be said that we may save that as another topic. No, absolutely. And it'd be weird to talk about licensed D&D &D games when we're also gonna be talking about D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah, D&D &D as a license. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's interesting. And uh, like one of the things uh, we, we didn't mention because we were, we were really going with recommendations here was, again, some of the bad stuff. And you mentioned Clue there. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I had that experience with Harry Potter Clue where they just clutched it horribly. Uh, except apparently there is a, there is another Harry Potter Clue which does it right. So, <laughs> you know, right. And, 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 and even just trying to separate which of them is the right one on Board Game Geek has been difficult. So... Um, and I bet you have problems with people reviewing one thinking it's the other one. Absolutely, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, again, there's always that strange crossover on, on on both Board Game Geek and Amazon even when they when they swap. Uh, so uh, there we go. The Thunder Thunderbirds game is good. Uh, co op by that. the Pandemic guy. Yeah, I have heard Matt Leacock. I have heard that the Thunderbirds game is really good. Uh, the Ghostbusters game is not. <laughs> Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier should be good, but the component quality is bad. Um, I don't know. I, we, we, that's, that's why I didn't really want to get into the good and bad. I wanted, well, I did want to get into the good, but there, there were, there are a lot of bad. We could like, uh, even yeah. in the hobby board game world, right? So we were talking about Star Trek games earlier. Uh, is it called Star Trek, the final frontier? It is basically roll for it is a dice game where you're just trying to get dice combos to take cards. And, and the, the really big deal is that you could play the next generation crew or the original crew and you can mix and match. But all it is is you get a character card and you can flip it over. Like, <laughs> it, it, it's just, oh, I, I think it's called First Contact. Now I'm forgetting what it's called. Star Trek. I don't like this one up. It can't be First Contact. What is it? It was a roll and write game. Well, not a roll and write, but it's a dice game. Five-year mission, Major Kellis. Five-year five -year mission? mission? There you go. Five-year mission. One of, one of the biggest problems I have, and I think, and this oh. is actually... Um, uh, and she games was joking about me buying uh, buying the the property the the Harry Potter property anyway, um, and we didn't actually now that I now that I remember, uh, and it's one of the huge problems and and one of the reasons that these some of these horrible licenses work, is oh 
I know you're a Harry Potter fan. I should go out and buy you a Harry Potter game. And, well, yeah. the, the, you know, the relative or the friend or, you know, great aunt Edna goes out and buys mm -hmm. you this Harry Potter game because Harry Potter is good and here is a Harry Potter game. And mm -hmm. I know Clue is good, so Clue, this must be good. Right. Um, and I think so much of the money on these is made off of purchases just like that. I know what Clue is. I yep. know you like Harry Potter. This must be good. Well, that's um, it, yeah. And, and you know, that, it's that, easy money for people who don't know. <laughs> that's part of why I'm glad the board gaming is becoming more mainstream and hobby board gaming in particular, and people are learning yep. that there are good games. And the fact that there are good licensed games, because that was the thing is, yeah, and June would be like, oh, it's it's Harry Potter and it's Clue. I have to buy it. Meanwhile, all us board gamers are like, oh, it's Harry Potter. I'm like, oh, that's probably going to be terrible because every licensed game is terrible. Yeah, no, I bitch kill is mentioning the Doctor Who uh, uh, skinned games. I'm like, I've got Doctor Who Yahtzee. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's all there. It's and it's so easy to just again slap the stickers on it. Um, yeah, I remember playing Dragon Ball Z Yahtzee with twos on her birthday, and I'm like, so what in this makes this Dragon Ball Z? And it just has all these symbols on it. And yeah. I'm like, well, how do you know what's a one, two, or three? And they're like, you don't. And I'm like, well, how do you know you have a a yeah. a, 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 a Yahtzee a, a series? Like and I'm yeah, like, so what in this makes it Doctor Who? Yeah, or not, that, or and the Dragon worst Ball. part about the Doctor Who game was the the shaker was a TARDIS, which is great, and it was, yeah, it was actually a cool. really nice TARDIS. Except mm -hmm. they didn't bother to felt the inside, so oh, it geez. was so just crack, 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 oh. crack. I mean, it was loud, Ooh. like deafeningly loud. Like let's just wow. put the TARDIS on the table and we'll use our hands to shake the dice because we don't want to listen to that. Um, it was. I've been painful. really tempted to pick up uh, Firefly Yahtzee. Because the the cups of serenity and the serenity is really nice. Oh yeah. Well, or, sorry, not serenity. It's a yes. Yeah, serenity is that the name of the ship? Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pass on that. It's been ages. I'm yes. I think. it must be serenity. Serenity's got to be the name of the ship. It was a Firefly oh. class ship. It's got to be named Serenity. Um, but no, it's it's one of those things where, um, uh, you know, they 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 can again. They're they're trying to catch the eye of those people who don't know any better to buy yeah. it. Uh, it's a, or it's or collectors who just switch, want right? like again, I don't mind having the TARDIS ga game around or the the Doctor Who Yahtzee around because the TARDIS is really nice. Like just yeah. having that TARDIS sitting on a bookshelf looks nice. Um, we just don't necessarily, you know. And if we want to play Yahtzee, we can pull the dice out and use them, or just grab one of the thousands of D6 lying around the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so they're they're and again, it's one of those things where. Yes, the hobby board games are getting into stores like Toys R Us has a lot of hobby games in it now. But the problem is it's still going to scare off, you know, Aunt Edna and Uncle Bob. Until um, that generation yeah. ages out, basically. And the next generation's like, I'm not buying that stuff anymore. Yeah. All righty. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the works. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, new YouTube videos, reviews, anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, the holidays are coming. It's after Remembrance Day here in Canada, so that means it's shopping time. I realize most of you Americans will wait till after Thanksgiving, which is cool. Uh, gamers are notoriously hard to shop for. You never know what games they want, what games they already have, what expansions they have, and what games other people may have bought for them. But we've got you covered. During the month of November, I'm updating all of my gamer gift guides. Now, these are lists of things to get the game into your life that are not just more games. I've already updated my gift guide for the aspiring tabletop game designer, which includes tons of stuff for prototyping and making your own games. Earlier this week, I published an updated Everything in Its Place gift guide featuring board game component storage solutions. Things that are going to help you, your gamer, get their games to the table more often due to quicker setup and takedown. You can check out all of our gamer gift guides over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gift guides under the bell or get to the gift guides directly by going to tabletopbellhop.com gifts. 
All right, last but not least in our announcement session, I want to give a shout out to RPG and Co. We've been working with Brian Weiss as part of our new look. Uh, you can start to see some of his work through our social media logos and some of our YouTube videos featuring our new logos. I also have to thank Brian for this awesome What's Your Initiative Skull shirt. Well, check out Brian's work through RPG and Co. at playrpgandco.com. Up next, a look at a licensed game both of us have gotten to play recently, Microsoft Minecraft Builders and Biomes from Ravensburger. All right, Builders and Biomes was just released this year by Ravensburger. It was designed by Ulrich Blum. Now, the art isn't screenshots from the game, but for whatever reason, I couldn't find out who the artist was. It didn't seem to be accredited on the box. I couldn't see it on um, Board Game Geek or anything like that, which was kind of weird, but whatever. Now, Sean's the big Minecraft fan here, and when he heard this game was coming out, he actually went and found me a press contact so I could request a review copy of this game. Yeah, I was actually uh, watching the uh, Minecon live on on uh, YouTube, uh, which is the annual Minecraft big show that they do every year. Uh, and they announced this game and I hopped onto Twitter and uh, the PR people at Minecraft, who I follow, connected me with the PR people at Ravensburger and I passed that off to you. Yep. And lo and behold. Yeah, it worked great. I sent Ravensburger an email and they were more than happy to send me a copy to check out. So thank you for that, Ravensburger. Even better, they sent me some other stuff too, which was awesome. I totally wasn't expecting that. So they really stepped up. They're like, oh, if you're interested in this game, what else do you want to review? Which is great. So up first, what's in the box? All right, the first thing you're gonna notice when you open this is a big bag filled with large wooden cubes in four different colors. These are the big chunky cubes. Uh, the ones I first saw in Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. Not your little small resource cubes, but nice chunky, I don't know, they're probably about one inch, maybe a little less. Uh, so that means they're great to handle for a wide range of ages and dexterities, but it's not all roses on that front. We'll get to that later. Uh, there's a rather thick rule book, which I got to admit, I was like, what the heck is this game about? But it's thick because it's in a wide variety of languages and that's what makes it so big. The rules are so, so they are not the most clear I've read. Um, I have a feeling English rules were a translation. This game, Ravensburger is a German board game company who exports their games here to North America. Uh, thankfully, though, there's lots of examples in the rule book. So that kind of helped us figure out what we were doing. Yeah, luckily, it's a pretty easy and straightforward game. I haven't actually picked up the rule book or read it yet. Uh, I think most people will probably, you know, one person will buy it, flip through the rule book get it to the table and you'll figure it out quickly. It's really yeah. not a tough game. Yeah, being able to actually touch and see the stuff definitely helped with this one. Just reading it in the rule book was a little rough. Um, next, you have four player boards and a bunch of punch boards. And I got to say, both were rather thin. The player boards are like terraforming Mars thickness, which means not thick at all. Uh, punch boards, uh, not quite as thin as the player boards, but also I would say disappointingly thin. Now, having played the game after that, there is a reason for this, I think, and that's because most of the tiles, there's like 64 of them in the game, are meant to be shuffled. So making them thinner definitely helps with that. But I gotta admit, they just kind of feel cheap and flimsy. Yeah, and I think they made a compromise here, but in the wrong direction. Uh, if they were a bit thicker and more resilient, I'd have just dropped them in the box yeah. lid and shook to shuffle and, and been good. Whereas this way, you're actually trying to shuffle cardstock a thick a thick enough cardstock to make it difficult to shuffle yeah um and so it's a little awkward there now the stuff you are punching out of the punch boards are player pawns uh you put these in color coded plastic standees not the fanciest thing a meeple or something nice would have been a little nicer there are as i mentioned 64 terrain tiles uh, a bunch of treasure chest tiles that are a little smaller um some weapon tiles and some very useful rule and scoring summary tiles so oddly only in two sets, despite this being a four player game. Uh, there are some walls too for building this mining cube, which I'll get to in a minute. And then there's weapon tiles for each player. Technically weapon and potato tiles. Yes, but aren't the potatoes just bad weapons? I don't know. I, I, I pictured throwing a potato and it doing nothing. Uh, you can't actually throw, throw. Well, I mean, you can, you can, you can drop anything, but you can't actually uh, throw potatoes. They, they really are just a way to uh, eat something, eat food that harms you in the game. 
Okay. See, I saw the potatoes, and I just thought you were throwing potatoes at the monster, and they did no damage. So that shows what Sean knows, Minecraft, and I don't. I, I got to admit, I wish the punch boards were thicker, but they work mostly. Uh, the, the, my biggest nitpick, though, the, is the XP counter. They used to track your score on your player board. doesn't even fit on the spaces on the scoring track. Like, what, what happened there? Like, where was the designer? And those thin player boards are thin enough that I'm, I'm worried I'm going to feel like, see a crease or fold in them every time I take them out of the box. They am worried the cubes in the box, if I turn the box the wrong way, may fold them. Uh, if you own this game and expect to play it a lot, I would highly recommend laminating those player boards. Yeah. They, they definitely made some interesting choices. Uh, but let's be honest, there's a really good chance that they used an existing punch layout yeah. and put in some new graphics and ran it through the machine. Uh, while the XP token sizing mistake is dumb, um, it doesn't actually make a difference to the game. It just True. reduces the polish and, the, and the, the sort of professionalism feel of the game. Uh, but how does Minecraft Builders and Biomes play? Well, you start off by building the mine. This is done by creating this box structure out of walls that are on the punch boards. And then you pour in all the cubes and then you a little bit of shaking and shifting. Actually, everything should fall into place and make you a nice four by four block of cubes. And I gotta admit, I was surprised. This works really well, and it wasn't that hard to do. Now, the reason this works well is because of the finish on the cubes. Uh, it's a tiny little bit sort of a glossy paint. Uh, so they find their place in the walls like sand finding its level as it shakes around. Unfortunately, the next step is to take that the walls off the, the cube, and they're still slick. And, and problems may occur. <laughs> Up next, after you've got your little mining brick cube thing, you lay out those 64 tiles in a four by four grid and stacks of four tiles each, all face down. Then you're gonna take those treasure chests we mentioned earlier, shuffle them up and place them on the end of each row and column, put your player pieces in the middle and you're good to go. Each turn, player's gonna do two things. Each of the two things has to be different. This includes moving between the stacks of tiles, and when you move, you reveal everything that's around where your pawn ends. Uh, mining bricks from that block, take trading cubes you've already mined to build a tile that you're next to, or fighting a mob that's already been revealed. Or if you're at the edge near those treasure chests, collecting weapons if you're next to them. Now, technically the chests contain tools and weapons, but any good Minecrafter knows that <laughs> any tool will damage a mob if you're in a pinch. Now, each non-treasure tile of those 64 tiles are either a building or a mob. There's definitely way more buildings than mobs. Buildings each have three features. The biome they belong to, a building material they're made of, and a building type. Now, mobs have a health level, an amount of XP points they give you for defeating them, and a potential scoring bonus. Now, to build a building, you just trade in the right blocks, take the tile from the main board, and put it on your personal playing board. To collect a mob, you've got to fight. Now, to be clear, they are not using all of the game's biomes. Uh, there are a lot of biomes in Minecraft, and I believe there's only four different biomes that are actually included in the game, uh, which is maybe a little bit annoying, but at the same time, it makes the game possible uh, because the scoring would not really be yeah. feasible uh, if they did, because of the way they've gone with the game otherwise. So they've got the basic biomes. They've got your desert, your snowy mountain, your plains, and your uh, forest. forest. Uh, so, so far we're on theme and uh, using game concepts for the mechanics that make sense to a Minecrafter. Uh, they've stayed on brand or license as we're talking in this episode. And yeah. unlike the Minecraft card game, it makes a lot of sense to a Minecrafter at this point. Now, fighting's kind of neat in this game. Uh, each player starts with five weapon tiles. There are three of them are the poison potatoes we talked about earlier that do nothing. The other two are basic wooden weapons that do almost nothing. They do almost no damage. To fight a mob, you're going to shuffle your tiles and draw three of them. So there's a pretty good chance at the third of the game you're getting potatoes. You're going to look at the damage you did and compare it to the health of the mob. If you beat the mob's health, they take the tile. Now, the edges of the board have those treasure chests that have way more tools and weapons. Each weapon type is unique, and all of them are better than the stuff you start with in your base deck or your base treasure thing. Um, these, again, are pretty tied to the, the, the theme of the game. For example, if you have the pickaxe, it does a little more damage in your basic sword, but it also lets you mine a cube from the cube block every time you draw it. 
They even have a hoe for when you want to swing at a creeper and feel the inevitable explosive death approaching. Note, player <laughs> death isn't actually a thing in this game. <laughs> yeah, there's no way for the monsters to attack you. They're just something out there that you can collect for, like I said, for bonuses, bonus points, and game scoring. Now, players are collecting these tiles and building on their player boards, trying for the best score during three separate scoring rounds. Now, a scoring round happens every time you get rid of a level of the mining block. So someone's taking the top four cubes off. The first scoring round is going to score based on biomes. You basically look at your board and find the largest group of tiles touching each other that have the same biome and score points on that. Different biomes score different points based on the rarity. And then the second and third scoring round is basically the same, but you're doing it for different things. The second round is based on the building materials that your tiles used. And the final round scores on building types. And that's pretty much it. Like, despite seeming a bit complicated based on the rulebook, gameplay is pretty straightforward, quick to teach, and quick to play. Yep. You build with biomes, crafting, mob busting, mining. Again, they really aimed straight and true at the players. Uh, and again, they played it for the gamers as well, because not only are you are you playing the the long game of these three rounds, and you need to start thinking about that round three right from game uh, right from round one, uh, or you're going to be in trouble uh, when someone has, you know, someone else has already thought of it. Uh, but also there is another sort of secondary game going on with that cube because there's the timing of when you trigger that scoring. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to, whether you want to hold off because you haven't got something or if you want to jump in there and grab those last cubes uh, to, to get the, to, to finish round one because you've got the scoring advantage at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and rush along. It, it really is uh, more layered than you would expect for a game based on an eight, you know, basically an eight bit digging game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to admit, I, I wasn't, I was expecting another simple mass market game, basically someone cashing in on the Minecraft name. And I was pleased to find a real game here, a solid game. Basically all the stuff we talked about earlier, about what makes a good licensed game. It has those. No, it's not. A board game simulation of playing Minecraft. Oh. It doesn't really feel like playing the video game. I have played some Minecraft. I do know a bit what I'm talking about here. You're doing some of the things you do in the video game in this board game. Like, yes, you have to spend time mining various resources in order to build structures. You also have to be cognizant of where you're building what. And that's actually the key part of this game is you need to watch what you build and when you build it. Then you also have to deal with the various monsters. And to do that, you're going to need to upgrade your equipment. All of that are all Minecraft things. Now, that being said, it's not all roses. Uh, we talked about some of the building material issues and the yep. building cues are a, a bit slippery. Um, we we I, we actually had some, some cube issues in, in our plays already. Uh, and because you've built this cube of slightly slippery smaller cubes, um, not only is cube collapse a problem, but you've also got the issue of not really being able to maneuver it around. So mm -hmm. someone is going to have to get up and walk around the table in order to see what cubes are on the backside and what can be grabbed. And it's, it's, it, so while I, I really enjoy the mechanic they've gone with, um, you know, something like a small lazy Susan may be ideal yeah. for this because uh, it, it's problematic otherwise. But then if you spin your lazy Susan too fast, you could collapse the entire cube because the blocks are a little bit slippery. Um, I would have preferred to see a little more texture on them so that they they grip. And now that would have been that would have caused problems in the assembling of the cube. It. But once that cube was assembled, they'd actually stick together a little better. Yeah, just overall, some of the choices on component quality are are suspect. I'll use the term. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's fair. Now, what I'm not sure about with this game, though, is how it's going to do, right? This is still brand new. Uh, there's not a lot of people talking about it as far as I, to be, well, I am 600 episodes behind on podcasts. Maybe I just haven't heard them yet, but I haven't seen a lot of hype on this game. I worry that this is a little too heavy for the mass market audience, the, the Minecraft audience, right? The, the video gamers who don't play hobby board games. So it may not get out to Minecraft video game players. And I also worry it's going to scare away hobby board gamers because like, oh, what the heck? It's a board game based on Minecraft. Licensed games are not good. So I, I don't know about that one. I, I worry it's going to miss the mark for both markets. Yeah, so uh, it, the release in North America is this week. So oh, that's okay. part of the problem. Uh, Friday, I believe, the, the 15th is uh, is North American release there date. There you go. We're, it was released much earlier in Europe, and I'm not quite sure. I, I guess it was a spiel 
uh, a spiel release date, I, you have to assume. Probably. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we're, we're on the cusp now. We're, we're actually, again, look at us. We're, we're new and fresh. Cutting edge. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, we're in a place where licenses are getting much better. But hobby gamers are still likely a little gun shy because of what we've talked about earlier. Uh, what we may get is that, as we talked about earlier, that generation of newer gamers who can grow to accept that, that there really are good licensed games out there. And it's not all, you know, trouble with different stickers. I gotta admit, I'm still there. I, I until I see a positive review, I don't trust a licensed game. Now, caveat being certain companies that produce good licensed games, I'm now going to trust, right? So, for example, Fancy Flight, if they put out a licensed game, I'm thinking that's probably pretty good. Now, having played this and a couple other games like Jaws and Horrified, Ravensburger just announced today they have the Back to the Future license. I think that was today or yesterday. Just this week, they announced they had the Back to the Future license, and they are putting out a Back to the Future game in 2020. If I had heard that before playing this and playing Jaws and playing Horrified, I'd be like, ah, yeah, whatever. It's, it's probably going to be another dark. It's going to be another um, labyrinth. But now, having played these good Ravensburger games, I'm definitely going to check out Back to the Future. Yep. No, I fully agree. Uh, there's, you know, so much out there happening right now. Yeah. So going back to Minecraft Builders and Biomes, I got to say I enjoyed it. I am not a big Minecraft fan, but I have played. I, I know enough about Minecraft and I can see the tie-ins to the video game, the board game. I also really like the amount of strategy and forward thinking required to score well in this game. This is, I would almost call it a thinky filler. Like there is enough going on with having to plan three scoring phases ahead to put it into that category. I just wish the component quality were a bit stronger. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I did not expect the level of planning and forethought this game requires. And now while younger players can certainly learn it, um, mm -hmm. it is trickier than you would expect for what many people consider to be a kid's game. Yeah. I don't know that I should look at the age on this one. I don't know what market they were aiming for. By the Based on the cover of the box, I think kid's game, but then the fact it's Ravensburger, they do both, right? Ravensburger is such a mixed bag, right? They they put out Enchanted Forest and the Labyrinth that, well, I'm going to confuse people, the non-David Bowie Labyrinth. Like everyone knows that old classic Labyrinth game, that's Ravensburger, right? right. They're, they're a German toy company that got into board games. But then they also put out Steffenfeld's Carpe Diem, and they're the people behind all the Aaliyah big box and medium box games. Like they're, they're such a mixed bag. And I don't know where this falls in their marketing. I think it falls in with Jaws and Horrified yeah. and this new look to, yeah. to Ravensburger. And so it's a 10 plus age. Yeah, so that's older, right? That's not yeah. kids. Now, community much. is saying six plus, and I sort of tend to agree with that. I mean, I once you... the strategy, though. The strategy is tough, but I, I mean, I feel like my kids probably could have gotten in, but again, gamer family. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, and uh, Board Game Geek has it as a weight two, which I think is probably about right. Yeah, that's which is, like I said, high for yep. most mass market. It's not trouble with stickers, right? Absolutely, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's not Minecraft the card game. Yep. So I got to say, if you're into Minecraft at all, check this out. Like, pick this game up. You're probably going to dig it. It is the best Minecraft tabletop game on the market by far that we've seen. If you're not a Minecraft fan, though, you still might want to check this out. If you want a nice, short, quick, thinky filler that's all about planning ahead and messing with your opponent's plans, this may be one of the perfect games for you. For a more in-depth look at, miners, at Minecraft Builders and Biomes, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bell Hops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what games uh, have happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? All right, every week we like to take this look back at the games we played, events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, it was a super slow gaming week for me, uh, all because of Extra Life. We talked about Extra Life pretty much at great lengths last week. Um, on our last episode, talked about all the things going on. And I'm sure if you tuned into this, you can understand why we're all a little burned out around here. I basically took a week off. No public play events, no events at local game stores. I didn't even have a game night at my house. But I didn't go home right away because, well, we did a lot and I wasn't <laughs> safe to drive after uh, some of that stream uh, for various reasons, but that's a whole different story. Uh <laughs> So, yeah, we did the only get a reason I do have anything to talk about here is that Sean was down for extra life and he stayed in town until Monday afternoon. 
And as he just kind of hinted at, he did have some car trouble. So while his van was at the shop, we got in a couple of games. Because uh, what else are you supposed to do when you're uh, in Windsor with uh, Time to Kill sitting in a room full of board games? You just should have got some pizza to go at the same time. <laughs> Uh, the first one was the new Minecraft Builders and Biomes game, which we just talked about in our review segment. Uh, the only thing I'm going to add here is that this time it was a three-player game with Deanna, and I'm surprised to report even she liked it. She noted that earlier in the chat. She's like, even I thought it wasn't half bad. Uh, she has zero ties to Minecraft, never having played the game herself, and only hearing us and the kids talk about it, which goes to show that the game can be enjoyable just as a game. No, absolutely. I, again, we talked about the mass market appeal of uh, the game as a both a license and a game. Now, the second game we played together was Horrified. Now, previously, I had played a game against Dracula and the creature from the Black Lagoon at Extra Life. And so we made sure to set up this game with two new monsters. We chose the Mummy and the Invisible Man. Uh, this was both Deanna and Sean's first time playing. Now, the big thing I noticed right away on this play for me was how different the game felt just by swapping out those two monsters. The swapping out the monsters not only changes the feel of the game, just the way things are playing out and the, the art and the miniatures involved, but the game mechanics actually change. Now this game is all about collecting items. That's pretty much the, the theme. It's a co-op game where you're gonna go around and collect items and use those items in some way. The collecting items part doesn't really change except for which ones you might want but how you use them changes completely for each monster. For example, the Invisible Man, we had to gather items from specific places on the map and bring them to the police precinct, which represented us providing evidence that the Invisible Man exists. For the mummy though, it was all about getting yellow items and using them at the museum to try to solve a sliding block riddle puzzle. Now, the interesting thing about this game is the, the colors are actually thematic. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, it's easy to ignore that when you're playing the game, as aside from the color and number, uh, there's no real reference to what's on those items. Uh, no. As you lay them out, you can sort of pay attention to, oh, that, you know, all these items over here are weapons and all these items are mystical objects and things like that. Uh, but when you actually get to the gameplay, it's a yellow two. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time. I gotta admit, like the first time we played, we were really amused because the pitchfork and the torch both ended up in the barn and we're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. We're collecting a pitchfork and a, and a torch to go try to fight Frankenstein, right? Which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah. I, it, it's again, it's, it's the Lords of Waterdeep argument. Are they black cubes or are they thieves? There was some of that in there. Now we end up winning our battle versus the mummy and the invisible man pretty handily. Uh, so then we set up our first three player, three monster games, sorry, not three player, three monster game. But at that point, I had to go pick up my mom for visiting my dad. So you and Deanna actually played that one without me. How'd it go? Well, you know what? We ended up losing. And this is the first time I think we've actually, uh, any of us had lost any, uh, a game of Horrified. Uh, and that actually gave me confidence that this was a real <laughs> game. Uh, because up until that point, I really wasn't sure. Um... Now the the rule book states that you should start off, you know, with two with two monsters against however many players. Wait, actually um, specifically Dracula and yes. the creature first. Uh, Once you've done that, try two random monsters. Right. Uh and and I kind of disagree with that after, now that I've played that. I think if you're a gamer, um play two monsters once just to get the feel of the game and 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 work out the mechanics. Uh but then never play two monsters again. Uh, cause to me, it feels really easy. Um, but that being said, uh, three monsters was not easy. It was, it was a definite challenge and, uh, you know, it was enjoyable. I have to say, you know, I, it, even with three players, even losing it, even losing, it was really, not, uh, fun because, you know, there was that stress of mm -hmm. trying to work out how you were going to win when you knew things were getting ugly. Um, and the fact that, you know, we were sitting around, feeling that stress build up, right? That's, that's thematic to a Universal Monsters game, right? Fair. You should be feeling stress. You should be feeling that, that overwhelming pressure of mm. impending doom. And I felt that. That's a good sign. I say I'm impressed by it. I'm, I'm very impressed by Horrified so far. I really like the variety I've seen. Uh, it's been a huge hit with pretty much everyone I played it with. Uh, it seems, and plus online, I see a lot of people talking about it. Now, the one thing I have seen in this game that can be a problem 
because it's all open information. There is no randomness on your player turn. Is the same problem you're going to have in any open information co-op game, and that's quarterbacking. Similar to games like Pandemic, it is really easy for a strong personality to take over the game and tell every other player what they should be doing. And I'll admit, not in our gameplay on the weekend, well, it was on the weekend, but not on Monday, we did have the problem where like someone literally was moving someone else's pawn around the board. So watch for that. Now, it's interesting, uh, Angie Games is bringing up in the chat room that she has a lot of nostalgia for the IPs. And she's just mentioning it now, but it was it was it came to my mind as well. I wonder because of some of the um, poor choices that have been made in reinvigorating the IP, mm. whether or not um, modern or younger generations have that same nostalgia for the this property that we might. I mean, we grew up with you know some of the you know Elvira and and you know monster movies and uh, mm -hmm. you know monster movies on on Saturday afternoons and things like that. And I don't know if that's there. And I mean, movies like uh, you know Tom Cruise in the Mummy is not going to reinvigorate this property. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I couldn't answer because I'm not a young kid. I will admit I've never seen any of the movies that this is based on. Oh wow! I just <laughs> not I didn't watch horrors growing up, so I haven't seen any of them, and I still like the game. Uh, and and you have just shocked your wife dramatically, yeah. and there may be some tying you down in front of Netflix coming up. <laughs> I don't think any of them are on Netflix. If they're not on Netflix, I don't see them. Yeah, they're fair enough. Uh, right. The mummy I know has Brandon Fraser in it. So yeah, well, let's uh, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> How about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. So this weekend, easy mode on Sunday. No Sunday. Uh, they got a bunch of students coming from the U of Windsor on Saturdays for a big, uh, you know, educational event. So we moved our game night to Sunday this coming weekend. No, that's Sunday. I don't even know what this Sunday is. The 17th? Yes, the 17th. 17th. Sunday the 17th. So any of you listening on the podcast, this has already gone by. And hopefully I saw you on Sunday. The week after that, though, this is the one everyone's going to get to hear about, is we are back at the CG Realm from 5 to 10 p.m., November 23rd. At that event, I will be showing off Cthulhu Death May Die, the cooperative dice chucker from Eric Lang and Rob Davio, the new hotness from Cool Mini or Not. And if you haven't got your Kickstarter yet, you can learn to play before you get it and <laughs> be ready to go right out of the box. Yeah, I haven't had anyone local complain yet that, that the stores have copies and they don't yet, but we'll see. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We appreciate their support greatly. Uh, Wayne Sabak Master Humfleet. Roger Malosh, thank you. David Miller Jr., thanks. Roger Linscott Jr., thanks, Roger. Brian Kurtz, who's been with us from the start. Well, that was the double bell. Oh, that means my shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts with this podcast, our YouTube, and the blog, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Also, just a little note, remember we're only two weeks away from our November AMA. That will be on November 27th. Oh, uh, that's coming up quick. It Time is? flies. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. <laughs>